I'd say take it away. All right. I'll just uh, share my screen here. Uh, so hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt LeCompte, and uh, I'm part of the resource conservation team at Thousand Islands National Park, where I help uh, complete different environmental monitoring and uh, help carry out projects to help species at risk, uh, like I'm talking about today. And uh, I'm really happy to be here for World Wetlands Week. And uh, thank you to the Mohawk Council of Aquasasne and the Environment Program for inviting me to participate in uh, this World Wetlands Week event as it's such an important topic. And uh, I've really personally enjoyed some collaboration I've had with the MCA uh, over the last few years, including uh, like the deer herd reduction and doing some uh, preliminary wetland species inventories with JC uh, and others in 2019. And so today I'll be talking about the turtle incubation program at the park, along with some of the other actions that have been carried out through what we call the RARE project to help different reptiles and amphibians in this area, uh, which are some of my favorite species. And before I get too far into it, I'd just like to recognize that the Thousand Islands National Park is part of the unceded traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe people. And long before the park was established, the Thousand Islands were and still remain an important homeland with cultural and spiritual significance to the Haudenosaunee. And this is particularly evident as, as we talk about turtles. And just to give a little overview of what uh, I'll ta be talking about today, along with some uh, beautiful painted turtle hatchlings, as you can see here. Um, I'll talk about like the diversity present in the Thousand Islands area, uh, why action was needed and, and how we did it. So we'll start off talking a bit about turtles and the science, uh, and then we'll get to all the cute pictures of turtles. So uh, just just stay with me as, as we go through. And I'd like to take questions at the end. So hold on to those or throw them in the chat as we go. And uh, also to note, most of these photos are from 2019 when we were able to come together before the pandemic for some of these great conservation projects. And so just to give a little sneak peek again before we move in uh, to talk about turtles, uh, we'll mostly be talking about incubation today, but it's just one of the parts of the parks, reptile and amphibian recovery and education program, AKA RARE. Uh, and the goals of this program are to help different creatures like turtles, snakes, skinks, and frogs survive and thrive through uh, the different conservation activities and public education in initiatives that we're taking out at the park. As you can see through some of these photos here, different uh, things that we're doing. And yet both of these parts of the program are really important, both addressing the threats that some of these amazing creatures are facing and also raising awareness and inspiring the public to take some action and get some hands-on experience. So to give you an idea of where Thousand Islands National Park is, uh, as you can see here, uh, it's located along the St. Lawrence River in between Kingston and Brockville, and it's located in what's called the Frontenac Ax Axis or the Frontenac Arch, which is a link between the Canadian Shield and Algonquin Park to the north, down into the U.S. and the Adirondack Park and Appalachians to the south. And Thousand Islands has one of the highest diversities of reptiles and amphibians in all of Canada. There's 31 different species of those snakes, uh, frogs, turtles, and salamanders. And that's partly because of where the park is located here in the Frontenac Arch, where uh, there's a great effects uh, influenced by the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence River, which help moderate the climate and uh, help support a mixture of species that you can't really find elsewhere in Canada, like um, several species at their northern range that are usually only found uh, to our south and many different unique habitats which allow for such diversity. And because it has such high diversity, it also boasts nearly 50 species at risk. And we can't talk about our species at risk without mentioning our turtles, of course. So to talk about the turtles in the Thousand Islands National Park, as well as the, the general ecosystem, there's five uh, freshwater turtles and they're all listed as species at risk. As you can see here, we have the Eastern musk turtle or the sting 
and the Blanding's turtle, both as threatened species, uh, as well as our three others, the snapping turtle, the midlip painted turtle, and the northern map turtle, all listed as special concern. And there's eight uh, total species of turtles in Ontario, and they're all considered to be species at risk at this point. And they're all a little different in their biology and habitat use and how many eggs they're going to lay and when, at what age they're able to lay those eggs, but they all are facing the same challenges and threats, which has resulted in them being at risk. And I've personally come across each of these species in the area, having to move each of them off the road uh, during that uh, uh, egg laying time. And can't say I have any specific favorites, but it's quite rare to come around these threatened species, the stink pod and the blanding. So those are quite special to come across. But they're all all great turtles. <laughs> and you can't really talk about um, turtles without talking about wetlands. And since it's World Wetlands Week uh, here, we need to uh, discuss the importance of these wetlands. and. Uh, turtles are a vital part of the wetland ecosystem and e indicators of the wetland health. So wetlands really need to have diverse animals that play a role in keeping this ecosystem healthy. And the turtles play a really important part in that role. They can help clean wetlands by scavenging on dead fish and consuming different aquatic vegetation and create channels even through that vegetation for fish and other amphibians like frogs to use. And they also are really important uh, for turtles themselves. So turtles need wetlands and wetlands need turtles uh, both ways. So wetlands support most of the life functions. Well, wetlands support most of the life functions of turtles. So they need them for mating, for hibernating through the winters, to help regulate their body temperatures, uh, to forage for food, as I mentioned, to move around and to have refuge and protection from from predators. And so in general, we need to keep uh, healthy wetlands to support uh, these turtles and help them stay thriving and uh, surviving. And this is a picture here is a, a photo of the Jones Creek wetland complex, which is one of the largest wetlands coming off the St. Lawrence River. And this uh, wetland supports uh, most of those turtle species that I just previously mentioned. And to talk about turtle life history and rarity, there's turtles are such a long living species of being uh, on this earth for so long and some living for over 80 to 100 years. And given this long life, they also have a delayed maturity when they're able to reach a time to be able to lay eggs for the next generation. So Blanding's turtles can take up to 24 years and snapping turtles up to 19 years to reach that maturity to, to lay those eggs. So this really highlights the importance uh, that mature adults play in the system. And to look at this rarity, there's been studies that show less than one of 1,000 snapping turtle eggs actually survive to reach th that age that I mentioned to be able to lay the next generation. And so when you consider uh, how little eggs survive and the threats they face, it can take almost 60 years for one adult snapping turtle to replace itself in the population. So when we lose these adults uh, on the roadway or to other threats, it's really a catastrophic blow to these turtles uh, survival moving forward. So uh, it just highlights the importance of their protection and the threats that they're facing. Um, so yeah, once they reach that adult age, they still face other threats, but it, they have a much higher chance of survival. So that's just a really important part to consider about turtles as we try to protect them. And to talk more about the threats to turtles, uh, clearly if they're a holistic species at risk, their numbers have been going down for, for quite some time now. A uh, little story here, this beautiful uh, snapping turtle was crossing the road near that Jones, wetland, Jones Creek wetland complex that I just showed you. And it was unfortunately struck by a car and it ended up being transported to an animal hospital, Sandy Pines Wildlife Center, uh, and had ended up having a good story, but it's just uh, highlights some of those threats that turtles face as uh, trying to cross roadways and lay that next generation. But one of the major threats that they face 
is just their loss of habitat. So in Ontario, Southern Ontario, we've seen over 70% of wetlands lost in the last 200 years uh, to different development uh, such as agriculture and uh, residential uses. And so this is one of the main contributors to the threats they face, but um, outside of habitat loss, road mortality and nest predation are also threats and specifically in the Thousand Islands, the St. Lawrence River area, boat mortality and fishing bycatch uh, can also be major threats within the Thousand Islands National Park and in the surrounding area. And two of the main threats that we're trying to address through the program that I'll mention today uh, is the nest predation aspect and the road mortality. So nest predators uh, are what we call subsidized predators now, and they can have really big impacts on turtle nest, uh, consuming up to 100% of the eggs that turtles lay, and they can get to those within 24 hours that they're laid. And those are mammals like raccoons, skunks, and foxes. Uh, so as we develop uh, agriculture and housing, these uh, mammals can really grow in, uh, their pot in, in size and threaten the eggs of turtles. Um, so yeah, this really leads us to, to why we're doing this program. Um, it's the reason for incubating turtle eggs is to increase the local population of turtles while also increasing the awareness of species at risk turtles to the public, like our visitors, the landowners in the area, and our, our partners. And without intervention, the turtles may decline uh, and be lost from parks, even though we're protecting their habitat because these other threats are still occurring. Uh, so this program is trying to address those, those threats. And Thousand Islands National Park is just uh, one area within this uh, great ecosystem. So that outreach part is really important to be able to increase their protection and education of everyone in the area to help contribute uh, to protecting these amazing species. And so now moving into more of this project, uh, this map is just showing where our egg collection occurred. So you can see this is the main nesting area right on the side of uh, a county highway. And so the threat of road mortality is there and we have the Polly Creek and Jones Creek wetlands here with turtles on both sides that are looking to lay eggs. And as you can also see, there's some agriculture here and housing. So those predators that would go after the nests are likely could be inflated there as um, Parks Canada has done some research and set up uh, remote cameras in this area and have really seen uh, some severe nest pr uh, predation here, some years losing 100% of the nests to those predators within 24 hours. So this was an area that was uh, an ideal candidate for egg in incubation, just because there was very little survival from the eggs due to the nest predators. And we've also seen some major road mortality here for really important species like the Blandings turtle, the snapping turtle, and the painted turtle, which, which all cross this road to, to lay eggs. And here's another shot of just kind of zoomed out. This is the study and egg collection area, as you can see, as part of this huge wetland complex, uh, a lot of which is part of Thousand Downs National Park. And you have the 401 above, a lot of roads and threats in the area, even with all this protected area. So uh, now we have our confirmed site, it's time to take action, but to, to incubate the eggs, you have to, know when the turtles are going to be laying those eggs and that occurs in late June in late May to June uh, when the turtles lay their eggs they're looking for that suitable site with a mix of sand and gravel and uh, that's when when we take action to go collect those eggs uh, and then same as in nature the eggs would incubate within the ground from that uh, May to June time until the late summer around 60 to 90 days and then they would emerge in uh, August, September from the ground uh, back to the wetland. And this uh, process is mimicked in the incubation period as well. With the incubator, it usually takes uh, on the lower end here, 60 days or even a bit shorter, just because those conditions are, are really consistent and, uh, 
they they help them really grow fast. So we mimic this uh, process, collecting the eggs, incubating them, and then releasing them back to their their home wetlands. And so yeah, this is a little shot of the collectors in action. On the left side here, you can see a snapping turtle uh, that was being watched from the car and it had just laid its eggs in right on the roadside here. And so as soon as it was done without disturbing it, uh, our staff here went out and collected those turtle eggs. And that's, it's pretty simple process. You're just using some tools to dig up the very top material um, really carefully. And once you get to the softer soil below, you start using your hands, making sure not to disturb the eggs at all. And so once you get down to the eggs, you're slowly uh, excavating those and transferring them into our transportation containers here, uh, usually filled with sand. And it's really important not to rotate the eggs at this point as the embryos can break and you could lose turtles very quickly that way. So a lot of care is taken here to make sure those eggs stay stable and are transferred into the containers. They usually give them a little mark at the top so you know which way is up because um, they'll have to be moved again once they get to the, to the incubator. And so yeah, here's some of our staff in action, really excited about collecting those eggs and uh, getting ready to bring them to the incubator. And so yeah, now we're back at the lab and it's time to move them into the incubator. And this is done uh, simply by moving them into a substrate called vermiculite, which helps uh, retain their moisture. And this keeps the eggs from rotating well as well and keeps them nice and snug within that incubator. And yeah, it's a, it's a pretty easy process, uh, but a lot of care needs to be taken. and. Uh, just to make sure that everything is, is safe for the turtle. So uh, the mixture is about 50-50 for water to vermiculate and you want to weigh these containers afterward and record that because you wanna maintain the same uh, weight and moisture within the containers throughout the whole summer. So that will come up again as, as we care for the turtles throughout the summer. And just to give you an idea of what the incubator look like, it's just a little mini oven that can keeps consistent temperatures uh, for the eggs. And yeah, this is it on the right. It's uh, this was in 2019. We had a full incubator full of uh, baby turtles, and it's regulated by a thermometer called a Herbstat. And for our program, we're maintaining the temperatures at 28.5 degrees consistently throughout the summer. And uh, the sex of turtles is determined by temperature in their nest. So for lower temperatures uh, around 23 to 24 Celsius, those would result in male turtles. And higher temperatures above 29 degrees Celsius would result in female turtles. So by setting it at 28.5 and having an intermediate temperature, uh, this appears to produce a mixed sex ratio, which is important. Uh, when trying to restore this wetland. And now they're snug in the incubator there and they need a bit of care throughout the summer. They need to be checked around twice a week uh, to make sure they're still safe. And this is once again, their weight. Their weight is compared to what's written on the label as you can see here. And if it weighs less than that, some moisture is added with distilled water. And the eggs are also checked for things like mold and denting and other potential issues and making sure the egg's still viable. And one way we can check that is with what's called an egg candler on the, on the right, which is a really cool tool. As you can see the embryo of the turtle here and this, uh, we usually only do this once a summer and it shows this turtle still is very healthy and uh, progressing to, to hatch later in the summer. And we also check incubator about once every day to make sure it's functioning correctly and the temperature and humidity is, is set well. And then as we progress around 50 days later, uh, the eggs begin to hatch. So here we can see some beautiful little baby hatchling turtles, uh, snapping turtles emerging from their eggs, uh, which is a really exciting time around the office that everyone looks forward to. And it all starts happening really quickly. Uh, 
all of the clutch usually starts hatching within the same day and a clutch is uh, one set of eggs from a specific female turtle so they're they're one family and they all start hatching within a couple days of each other and so once the turtle has been cracking its shell it usually takes uh, up to 24 hours for them to break free completely and if it takes longer than that there there could be intervention but this usually does is wasn't required and the, like this little guy on the right here uh gave us a bit of worry but he was able to break out on his own and these turtles are actually born you can kind of see here with a little tooth on their snout when they're born and this can help them uh cut out of that egg and emerge which is a really cool part of uh seeing them emerge and as they come out, uh, they're removed from that incubation container with the vermiculite and they're rinsed with some sterile water and uh, moved over to uh, a different bin uh, to progress. And they're born with what's called a yolk sac, uh, which looks like a small grape. I'll show you in a minute. And this is full of the, all the nutrients they need. Uh, you can see it right here. Uh, that's uh, that's their yolk sac and yeah it's all the nutrients they need for their around their first week of their life so you don't need to feed them uh, during this time period uh, they might also still have remnants of their umbilical cord attached to that yolk sac uh, so they're transferred to a hatchling container for around one to four days while they absorb um, that yolk sac because it's kind of a sensitive time where it, they can uh, get bacteria in there or become sick. So it's really important to make sure they stay in that other container until the yolk sac becomes dry, uh, like a flattened raisin. So a grapefruit raisin and uh, each turtle takes a, a different amount of time to absorb that. So you just need to monitor it and uh, keep an eye on that. So yeah, once that yolk sac is absorbed, the turtles are ready to move to a water-based setup. And uh, you can see that on the left here the um the little nursery uh that is set up and we just do that to allow the rest of the clutch to hatch so that the whole clutch and the family that the can be released at the same time to the wetland uh, like would be done typically in nature and at this point every turtle is also given a name which is usually a fun part so uh there was many names given out in the first year in 2019. I might have named one after myself. So hopefully uh, Baby Matt is still out there uh, thriving uh, in the wetland. And uh, yeah, they're usually not kept in this since after they're born. Uh, they're not usually kept within this for over a week um, past the time that the yolk sac would be providing their nutrients. And so now they're ready to head back to the wetland and they're placing their release bins and transported back to that same wetland where their eggs were collected. And you can see some painted turtles here. These ones were super cute, but so were the uh, snapping turtles as well. Uh, they just look like such miniature versions of themselves and they're uh, very excited to get back to the wetland. And then once they're there, it's time to release them and this is a really exciting time uh, and we try to get as many people involved as possible so they have all the instincts they need to survive in the wild uh, which is why a lot of them hide in plants in their in the release bins and to release them they're just simply placed on the water's edge not in the water uh, this will allow them to follow their instincts decide whether they want to enter the water or hide in the cattails and uh you can see one on the right here being released, a snapping turtle, uh, moving along the vegetation. And most of them do dip uh, under the water and hide, but uh, they, they each make their own decisions of where they want to go. And you can see some kids here involved. They're each given one turtle to, to gently place in the wetland and uh, a very exciting time. Um, and yeah, like it's it's such an important uh, time. This was in 2019. Uh, working with uh, the public and the part our partners of the public here, to tons of kids and families being involved in these what we call release parties. It's uh, very inspiring work and uh, inspiring others to take action as well. Uh, as well, and there's me and uh, some of our other staff. Uh, 
and you can see more people here some of our partners part of the release as well and hopefully we can do this again again soon getting more people involved because it's uh it's a really really fun and uh inspiring activity that uh, to be a part of and so just to give some some stats on uh on what was incubated in 2019 it was a really successful year we had over 200 eggs successfully incubated uh eight snapping turtle clutches so yeah once again that's uh families of eggs from so eight different uh turtles and uh that were that laid eggs and as well as one painted turtle clutch um and hatching occurred in 55 to 60 days so just below what would happen in nature in 2020 this past year uh Unfortunately, the pandemic impacted our ability to collect eggs. So we still were able to, to release 31 uh, snapping turtle hatchlings to the westland, to the wetland. But what we did see was severe nest predation, which highlighted the really important uh, work that was being done on this wetland. So by the time collection was able to occur, there was 28 different nests that were uh, predated by those predators that we talked about, like raccoons and foxes. And we were able to put out some nest protectors, but the only surviving nest, and yeah, the only surviving nest was one that was actually protected by nest protectors. So without that work in 2020, there would likely be no turtles emerging from this site uh, because of those predators. Um, so just uh, highlight the importance that there could be 0% survival there otherwise. And overall, there's been an over 90% success rate in incubating turtles uh, at our site. And this is just one part of the work that we're doing, as I mentioned before, with the RARE program. Uh, these are all stats from 2019, but the work did continue in 2020 as well. We had in 2020, we, we had huge outreach with uh, over 400 students being reached with turtle talks and presentations and hikes. We also talked to 106 boaters with our dog talks to focus on uh, turtles in the water and boating to try to prevent that boat mortality. Over 50,000 people are reached uh, with social media posts alone. And we also had some rare outreach kits uh, and different publications printed that we're able to share with partners and the public. We also built an artificial nest site, which I'll highlight in a minute, to help try to prevent that road mortality at this specific collection site. And we also had several nest protector building workshops, as you can see in the top right here, uh, where we built turtle nests with youth and different groups. And we held one with Alcrasasne youth as well, which was great. And in 2019, yeah, those nest protectors that we built, 67 ended up actually going out to local residents to protect turtles on their own properties, which is a really, really important. So just to highlight some of those, uh, this is the county road uh, where egg collection occurred and where uh, we've set out a couple nest boxes, uh, as you can see here. And within 2019 to 2020 we've had over 100 nest boxes distributed to local residents to help protect turtles and this is the artificial nesting site so this is actually just to the left of these nest protectors and that's that was built to try to provide a new space for turtles to lay eggs to to stop them from going on uh, to the roadways or crossing the roadways to, to prevent the loss of those adults and uh, we didn't have any turtles on that yet in 2020, but it takes some time for them to to find the site and uh, feel comfortable with it. So we're going to continue to monitor that and uh, hopefully have great success there. And some more pics here. Um, some kids that were part of the nest uh, protector workshops, building nest protectors. And this is a photo of the boat uh, talks. Uh, doc talks to help educate the public, which is such an important tool, as I mentioned. Uh, we can't do it by ourselves. And, and this is an example of hatchlings emerging from nests protected by nest protectors. So these photos were sent to us by some local residents in 2020 that used the nest protectors. And we have an acute little painted turtle emerging here. And we also had reports of the threatened landings turtle and snapping turtles. So that was really special to hear that there was some protection going on outside of the park. And 
we're continuing to move forward with Rare in 2021 with nest boxes and uh, doing more egg incubation and educational outreach, working with some commercial fishermen and advancing protection for turtles and probably some more virtual work like I'm doing today. Um, but just to, to leave on a positive note there, although you might not have an incubator, you can still, still uh, help protect turtles. Um, there's many things you can do. And one thing obviously is slow down on the road, especially during that May, June period where they're, the females are trying to cross and lay eggs. Um, so helping those turtles cross the road, uh, most of it's quite simple. Snappers can be uh, a bit more challenging, but they're still can be easily moved across the road in the direction that they were heading. So uh, that's a really important part to help those adults survive. As I've said, it's so important. And all these three turtles were turtles I just happened to come across driving to work. And then that was, they were all at that uh, county road where we collected the eggs. We have blandings, uh, painted and snapping turtles all trying to cross the road. Uh, just I happened to come across and uh, any property owners, um help protect nests so look where you can find nest protectors build your own it's quite simple uh you can maintain turtle friendly shorelines by leaving fallen wood and uh just maintaining a natural shoreline and also report your observations of turtles there's great apps like iNaturalist or uh reporting to to uh, different organizations in the community uh, and learn about turtles in your areas and, and tell your friends the importance of them and uh, and how they can help as well. So yeah, I'm looking forward to more great work in 2021. And thank you again for uh, letting me talk about uh, something I'm passionate about in turtles and one of my favorite projects. And uh, I'd be happy to take any questions or comments now. So uh, thank you again. Thanks so much, Matt. That was really great. Uh, it looks like we do have a question already in the chat from Jordan. Are the baby turtles always released in the same areas as eggs were collected, or do you sometimes need to consider better locations? Example, if nesting site is determined to be close to too many hazards. Uh, at this time, they're all released uh, to the same wetland. Um, because yeah, most of the turtles in the area might be fa facing these same threats, but since these turtles were laid at this location, we thought it's important to maintain that home wetland for them. And after they're incubated, that nest predation threat is gone. Uh, there still is other threats like predators, um, but most of these will persist at other locations. But that is a good question and a good point, considering that there is the road there and other threats. Um, but at this time, yeah, they're all released to the to the same wetland. OK, awesome. Thank you. Well, it looks like we have another question here in the chat from Alyssa. Is Sandy Pines Rescue a good resource to call if you come across a hurt turtle? Yeah. For sure, they're a great organization. Um, they're located in the Napanee area, so quite far from the Aquasasne area, but there's other uh, great rescue places in the area. There's uh, Rideau Valley uh, Rescue or Animal Hospital, I'm not sure the exact name, but I'm sure there's others too. So yeah, that's important to know. Uh, if you do come across a turtle, there are organizations that can help uh, if they are injured. Thank you. I believe there's also the trauma center in Peterborough, if that one wasn't noted. Yeah, the Ontario Turtle Conservation Center, I think. They they do so much great uh, work helping injured turtles and other animals as well. I know there's also a volunteer program to be turtle taxi. So if a turtle is injured and needs a ride, you can add yourself to a volunteer list to actually shuttle them over to the hospital because we don't always have rides for them. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, I have a question from somebody who's not able to include their questions in the chat. Um, not sure if it was mentioned earlier, but what is the material that is in the box surrounding the eggs when they're incubating? Uh, the material is called vermiculite, and uh, it really helps retain the moisture uh, throughout the summer. So yeah, it's called vermiculite. It's uh, like a mix of minerals, and uh, yeah, that's that's the material used. 
Perfect. And one other question from the same person. Do you ever hatch the eggs too early or too late? Um, we haven't had that uh, as the case. So like the temperature of the incubator is really going to determine how long it takes for that egg to incubate. So since we're setting it at 28 degrees, 28.5 degrees, um, they still hatched uh, just below 60 days. So around the required time. Uh, none really came out any earlier than 55 days. Um, some turtles did not did not hatch and, and survive, but that is uh, not something we could control really. Um, but yeah, we had over 90% survival, which is great. And uh, yeah, most of the turtles hatch within 55 to 60 days, which is just below the 60 to 90 days that usually occurs uh, in the natural environment. Wonderful. Okay, we have a question for us at MCA. Do you have any turtle specific research outreach programs going on this spring? Uh, we may have something that's going to be in the works, but it's not official yet. I can get more details and get back to you, uh, Jordan, with an email. No problem. <laughs> Do we have any other questions from the audience for Matt? Okay, well, not seeing any more questions. Uh, I guess we're going to take a brief break before our final presentation of the day and final presentation of World Wetlands Week by Clarkson University on vernal pool projects. Thanks, everybody, and thank you so much, Matt. That was fantastic. Thanks, Brittany.